Welcome to the Artist to Artist podcast. My name is Angie. I'm a freelance makeup artist and I am your host for this podcast. And in today's episode, I'm going to talk to you about a job I had recently where my model was submerged in water. I'm going to talk to you about how this job came about, rate negotiation, the products I used, and also set etiquette for this type of thing. So let's get started. It's probably best to start at the beginning and I will tell you how I actually got this job and what the scope of work was. I was contacted by a photographer that I know very well about doing makeup and hair for a book cover. Now, one of my clients for almost the last decade has been Harlequin romance novels. You may need to pause and Google that if you don't know what they are. So I have done hundreds of book covers and I'm very familiar with this type of job. And I also have worked with this particular photographer before. This job was actually for a new publisher I have never worked with. And the best part of it was, of course, our model had to be photographed lying in a body of water. So there was going to be a kiddie pool involved. I don't know if this is redundant information for you, but I'll tell you how these jobs are normally booked. So the publisher would hire the photographer and the photographer would then go and hire the team to to work on the shoot. So that is the chain of command for this particular type of job. When the photographer contacted me about the shoot, the rate for the job was going to be a very low rate. I would say it's about one third of what I'd like to be making for a full day of work on a job like this. The photographer knows me. This person acknowledged that the rate was low, which I appreciated. And I think before I get into talking about what goes on or what went on on set, it's probably good to talk about what happens when we're presented with low rates and how I specifically deal with this. The most challenging part when it comes to the rate discussion and also teaching about what makeup artists should be charging is that really outside of the union and outside of bridal, you're not going to have a consistent rate scale. And what I mean by that is there's this big misconception that in our industry, when you work as a makeup artist, you determine your day rate and clients hire you for the day rate that is determined by you. In some situations, there is going to be room for rate negotiation. You will get asked to present your rates, but a lot of the times with clients, the rate is the rate, and there are photographers that that will approach you or people that are hiring for a specific job that will approach you with the rate and budget already in mind. And for this specific job, the rate was the rate, and there really wasn't any room for negotiation. When I have people contact contacting me about jobs and they come with a very low rate attached. Here are some things that I think about when it comes to whether or not I'm going to accept the job. Now, I do want to be clear that you're going to have times in your career, many times actually, regardless of how long you've been doing this job, where you are not going to be in a position to turn down paid work. First and foremost, if you are in a situation where you need to put food on your table, you need to pay your bills, if someone comes to you for a lower rate and you're in this position, you should take the job because you need the money and that is totally fine. This is a position we all find ourselves in at one time or another, especially in this industry. I know there's people teaching about you don't accept low rates, you stick by your day rate or else it's going to be bad for your career. And there are some situations where that may be the case, but sometimes it's just going to come down to you needing the money and that is fine. Some of the things that I think about when I'm offered a low day rate for a job or a low rate for a job is my relationship with the photographer up to that point. I think about networking potential. I think about opportunities for content and I think about the job itself and if it's something I actually am just interested in doing or if it's going to be challenging to me in a way that is actually going to be productive, I'll consider the job. In this situation, I do have a long-standing relationship with the photographer. This person has given me work in the past, so that's something important to think about because not every job that we have in this industry, and this goes for all industry professionals are gonna be top paying jobs. There are gonna be situations where you will work with the same photographer for five different day rates because each client that photographer is working for has a different budget for their shoots. This is one of the many reasons why determining your rates as an artist can be very overwhelming and very confusing. So yes, I already have a relationship with this photographer. I also happen to know the crew and the crew on this job are some of my friends. We really enjoy working together and this concept was 
was really cool and I hadn't done a water shoot in a while. If you're in a situation where you get approached by a photographer that does not have a good reputation, maybe you haven't worked with this person in the past, maybe they're known for bad behavior on set, undercutting, late payments, this is a situation where you have to think about is the rate worth the trouble you're going to be going through working with this specific person. When I think about networking potential for a low paying job, I look at the size of the crew, I look at who the photographer is, I look at what the work is going to do for my book and how it's going to impact my social media. Is there an opportunity to create some content or to get a good photo or video for my Instagram? Is the look or the job something I'm interested in as a whole? Is the whole vibe of the shoot something I think is going to look good for my social? I think about who the talent is. Is it someone I want to work with? And in this specific circumstance, all I was thinking about was, yes, this is low paying, but I think this is going to be a great opportunity for content for artist to artist. This is something I can talk about on the podcast. I can maybe create a reel of content. I can create a newsletter or a post about tips for waterproof makeup. So taking all that into consideration, and because I know the photographer, I know the crew, I was getting some money and it was a great opportunity for content, I was in. With lower paying jobs that you are contacted about, you also have to think about putting up your boundaries in terms of what you're willing to do for the lower rate. For this job, it was a third of my full day rate. So I agreed with the photographer that I would only work three hours of the shoot day. The other element to this shoot was that the model needed a blonde wig. Now providing wigs is something that is actually out of the scope of our regular responsibilities as freelance hair and makeup artists here in Toronto. It's not expected that we have a full selection of wigs in our car trunk. So with the low rate, one of the boundaries that I set for myself was that I wasn't going to do anything that was out of the regular scope of work. I knew there was a wig involved, but I didn't offer to source the wig, pre-style it, or do anything to it. That was a boundary that I put in place for myself. If the photographer needed me to go and source a wig, prep a wig in any way or get any extra materials, then we would have to talk about compensation for that time above and beyond the rate for the job. These are just a few things to think about, but I thought it would be helpful to share my thought process. So essentially, I had a pre-existing relationship with the photographer. I work really well with the crew. I knew some of the people really well. We negotiated a shorter work time, which makes the rate more appetizing to me. And because this was a great opportunity to get content and take part in something that I thought was really cool and it would also kind of refresh my skills on doing more waterproof makeup, I decided to take the job. Now this was a water shoot and up until the point of me recording this podcast, I actually haven't gotten approval to share any additional content outside of the little sneak peek that I shared on my personal account. So I don't have a lot of images or a reel that I can share to explain to you how all of this panned out. So I'm going to try to describe everything as best as I can. Let's move on to the actual shoot and what happened on set. For this book cover, the model had to be lying face up in a kiddie pool, if you can imagine it, so not fully submerged. I have done fully submerged water shoots in the past. This is much easier to do. I had to secure a wig on the model because the model's hair was brown. The publisher needed her to be blonde. I also had to make sure the hair was going to be positioned in the water in a very specific way. And we also had to shoot wet hair across the model's eyes. So it looks like she was almost turning around in the water, if you can picture it. What that meant for me was that I needed to do a fully waterproof makeup application, which we'll get into in just a second second. I needed to make sure the wig was secured to her head and I needed to be able to get in the water in order to style and move the hair around in a way that's going to look good on camera. So those were kind of my main tasks for that shoot. With doing a fully waterproof makeup application, the great thing is that you skip over all of your powder products, which actually makes the application faster. So in this situation, I used all waterproof cream products or liquids. For some of the more intense shoots, and depending on the look that you're doing, you may need to get into using alcohol-based products. But in this shoot, thankfully, the makeup was very simple. It was very natural. Half of her face was going to be covered with wet hair anyways. But I also had to make sure that if we decided to do a shot where her hair wasn't covering her face, the makeup was still gonna look good. The products I decided to use were Danessa Myrick's Color Fix, which I used as an eyeshadow, blush, 
contour. For foundation, I use the Makeup Forever HD Liquid on the skin. I use this as concealer as well. I used a long-wearing liquid lip color from L'Oreal on the lips. I used Voluminous from L'Oreal Waterproof Mascara, and I sealed everything in with the Cryolin Fixing Spray. It worked like a charm. Her makeup did not move. Her face was getting sprayed with water the whole time. She had soaking wet hair across her eyes. There was no issue with the makeup. It held up and it looked really good on camera. If you are curious, that's how I did it. And again, it was a simple makeup application, but anytime I've had to do anything waterproof like this or really extreme, usually Danessa Myrick's Color Fix is my go-to. Another element to this shoot was that our model had to wear a wig and her hair was gonna be soaking wet in the water. So when you're in the situation, you have to make sure the wig is really secure to the head. In order to do that with her actual natural hair, I braided her hair. I put a wig cap on, which I pinned into the braids because you have to remember wet hair can be very slippery. So everything you put on the head has to be anchored and secure. So it was braids, a wig cap pinned into the braids, and then the wig was pinned into the braids and the wig cap. I hope that's something you can visualize. In the actual shot, we really did not see her natural hairline at all. So there was no reason for me to spend any extra time gluing the lace front wig onto the sides of her head or along the top of her head. So I just pinned the wig into place all along the perimeter of the face from above the ear, sort of all the way across. I used really good quality bobby pins. And because I had the braids in there and we had the wig cap, it was very easy to secure. In terms of what you would actually wear as an artist who's working on a proper water shoot, the best thing to wear is a wetsuit. And the reason you wanna wear a wetsuit is one, it keeps you warm because you're gonna be either in the water or in and out of the water. And when this happens for a long period of time, you can get cold really fast. And the other thing you need to think about is that as a makeup artist, we are going in and out of the water, you're bending over, you're standing over people. And for me, this is not really the time to be showing up in your bikini or your booty shorts. And I just don't think that's appropriate for a set. Of course, this is gonna be dependent on the job. So I would either do a wetsuit and if not a wetsuit, some sort of swimwear that is probably more on the conservative side. For this particular job, obviously it was lower budget. So I wasn't gonna go out and buy a wetsuit and I don't do water shoots or beach shoots that often or pool shoots for that matter. So there was no point in me investing in something like this and I don't have anything like this at home and I wasn't gonna spend the extra money. So what I wore for this were just gym tights and a long sleeve t-shirt. I'm sure you're thinking right now, did you go into a kiddie pool with gym tights on and a t-shirt? And yes, I did. And I will tell you the reason why. When we got more information about the shoot and how it was gonna be set up and the inspiration images, the model had to be lying in a pool with a black background. So basically, Based on what the shot needed to look like and the size of the pool, very quickly, the rest of the crew and I realized that we would probably have to be in the water with the model, making sure everything was in the right place. The background of this shot had to be dark. So for me to be in the water or any one of the crew who's gonna be in the water close to the model or close to the shot, our legs are gonna have a reflection in the water. So it was better for us to go in wearing all black to avoid any reflection in the water and that's what myself and the stylist did. The other thing to remember is that we have a live human being that is lying in the water and the shots have to go very quickly so we need to do whatever we can to get the shot fast to minimize the model's time in the water. What this also means is that you can't jump in and out of the pool because you'll move the water, you'll move the hair, you may move the wardrobe and all of this stuff has to be in a specific place and that is going to lengthen the shoot time. These are all of the things that you have to think about when it comes to what you're gonna be actually doing on these more complicated shoots, what you have to wear, and how you have to prepare. The other thing you have to think about is your footwear. I just wore Crocs for this because I know I'm not gonna slip when I'm walking around set. Of course, I brought an additional change of clothes for myself. I also brought extra towels for my model, my model's hair. I made sure to have a hair dryer ready on standby to dry her hair right away and to warm her 
up. I also had some hot paws in my kit. These are all things that you wanna think about when you're going through the process of figuring out what to pack and when you're also considering the safety and comfort of your model. When you are actually working on a set like this where there is water involved, you have to be very careful with your movements in and out of the body of water that you're working on, more careful than normal, because we have to be cautious of where we're walking on set. I did record content, but I didn't have my phone in my hand. I had my phone on a tripod out of the way of anybody, and I asked the crew and the photographer about the placement of the tripod before we started. I also got the okay to film content, just to make sure it's not gonna be in anybody's way, because you cannot have anybody tripping or slipping or falling with all of this going on on set. So on days like these, it's really about preparing for the job. It's about being safe. It's about looking out for your model. It's also about communication and listening. You have to be listening to what the photographer needs, what their instructions are so that you know where you need to be and you can work efficiently and everybody can work together to quickly get the shot. One of the interesting or I guess challenging elements of this shoot was the positioning of the model's hair because the hair was kind of one of the main features of the cover and it had to be floating on the surface of the water. It had to be draped over the model's face in a specific way and it also had to be positioned in a very specific way around her shoulders, the top of the head. So there was a lot of fine tuning that was needed on this particular shoot. I have done some very crazy jobs. I have done a lot of water shoots for whatever reason and what I've discovered over time is that one of the best tools for directing hair underwater are actually barbecue tongs because you can get them in an extra long length and they grab the hair so you don't have to be consistently putting your hands in and out of the water and they just kind of fluff the hair in a way that is very pretty if you're doing any underwater stuff. So if you're doing something like this, barbecue tongs work great. They also work great for flicking clothes and ponytails if you need to do this but also kind of be out of the shot. It's just something I have discovered <laughs> throughout my years of doing these crazy jobs but the barbecue tongs definitely save the day on this shoot. There is some other set etiquette that I think is important to mention. There were a lot of moving pieces to the shot so we have the model lying face up in the water. We have me standing in the pool making sure the hair is positioned across the face and around her head. Also in the pool was the wardrobe stylist and we had another assistant that was helping to make sure the fabric of the clothing was moving in the right direction in the water and there also had to be specific ripples going through the water that had to look a certain way. What that means is that we had four or five people who are all doing a very specific task at one time so the communication has to be consistent and then of course you have the photographer shooting. In these situations where there are a lot of moving pieces we're trying to move fast we're trying to make sure our model is staying safe and she's okay. It's really all about announcing what you're doing so that everybody who is working with you on that crew is on the same page. Once the photographer calls out that the shooting is starting everybody has to focus on their responsibilities so there's no time to check your phone there's no time to talk with the model or your co-workers on my end of things if I saw something with the hair that wasn't looking quite right we have very few frames to get this right so I have to communicate to the entire team and to the photographer that I'm going to be going in and adjusting the hair so you're kind of trying to create a rhythm of shooting and you're paying attention to everyone else's rhythm so you can all work in sync. When I had to go in to fix the hair, I would announce I'm going in to move the hair. Saying going in or stepping in, this is regular set lingo. This is normal language that you would use on set anytime you need to hop on to set and do some touch-ups. But I have to make sure the timing is right because I don't want the photographer wasting any frames with like the top of my head in the frame because the camera was positioned directly above the model's face. We all had to really pay attention and communicate with one another for the entire duration of the shoot. Once the photographer started shooting, I would watch for the hair, the wardrobe stylist would watch for the clothing, and we would all just kind of call out if there was anything we needed to adjust, and if there's a way that you could help someone else on the team, just because you're standing closer to something that needs adjusting, we would communicate that to one another as well. It's a situation or a job where you really have to be focused in on what you're doing, and you have to rely on really strong 
strong communication and teamwork in order to get the shot. And that's how this specific job played out. I am hoping I'm going to get approval to post some of the content I recorded. When I do, I'll be sharing it on the Artist to Artist Instagram. A lot of the times with publishing, the time period that passes between when we actually do the shoot and when the book comes out can be months. So who knows when I'm actually going to see what the final product looks like, but I will post it on the Artist to Artist Instagram account. So don't forget to follow me there. And if you are enjoying this podcast, please subscribe. I'm hoping that this glimpse into how I deal with rate negotiation, a little bit about set etiquette, some discussion about the products that I use on my more challenging jobs was helpful for you. And that is everything for this week. I hope you have a great rest of your week and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.